Hello and uh, welcome to Radio Arctic, both the ones that are joining us live uh, with the live broadcasting and here today at the Arctic Frontier Conference. Uh, I'm Anna and, and I'm Gudrun. And we are now going to have our third session um, called uh, Energy Securities is Geopolitics. And Gudrun is going to give us a short introduction. Oh uh, yeah. As the age of oil began, it was first a matter of military power. The US had the energy commodity that created an international anxiety around energy supply for countries res reliant on energy. At the same token, the Arctic potential importance for global e energy security was and <coughs> is m mostly something that is imposed from outside of the region with its prosperous yet to some extent undiscovered oil and gas resources. This has changed the Arctic and the rest of the world into a military competition, um, which to this day has affected the oil and gas markets, energy security in not only Europe, but also in the Arctic regions and societies. And on this note, uh, that we are at the Ar Ar Radio Arctic, we have invited Rasmus Gelson Bertensen and Maria Helena Sivone to talk about energy securities. So maybe, Maria, uh, would you maybe start by telling us which affiliation you are uh, connected to? And then we go to Rasmus. Thank you very much. And it's so nice to be here. Wonderful to be able to talk about energy security issues when we are here in Tromsein Arctic. Um, so I am a researcher at the Finnish Environment Institute uh, at the uh, Policies and Risks Group there. And I do my PhD for Tampere University with the plan to defend this year. Exciting. Yeah. Uh, my name is Rasmus Gesu Bertelsen. I'm Danish, but I actually grew up in Iceland. I'm professor of Northern Studies and Balanced here in Politics here at the Arctic University of Norway. And 2022-2023, I was the Nansen Visiting Professor of Arctic Studies at the University of Akureyri. So that was Hema home <laughs> in Iceland for, for me. Thank you. Tak. Uh, and then let's just dive into it. So what is en uh, energy security and what does it include in your field of work? If I remember right, uh, um, the International Energy Authority has a definition of energy security, which is something like uh, stable, stable supply of energy at an affordable price. Uh, and I think that's a very useful uh, definition of energy security at different levels. It's everything from the household to entire societies. And how is this different from the Arctic region? Well, Energy I would security. actually like to take this definition of EAR a little bit further. Okay. I think we do need in this contemporary world, we need a new way of defining energy security. Yes, indeed, the EAR already defines it quite broadly and you can uh, sp spread it quite far. But we, I think that we really need to put this human security and climate security and, and um, also military security into the picture, not to securitize energy, but to be able to talk about it from the wider perspective that we are. Our societies are constantly electrified. We are facing different kinds of threats from cybersecurity to data prote protection, for instance. And it's all uh, coming down to the fact that we use en energy for everything that we do in our daily lives. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, coming back maybe to, um, to the question of the Arctic region, uh, how, how does it differ? Do you want to? Or? I think uh, th there's often a, a discourse uh, talking about Arctic exceptionalism. I, I think it's important to distinguish between uniqueness and exceptionalness. And of course, the Arctic is a unique region. Every every region is unique, the Caribbean or the Middle East or whatever. Uh, I'm very. I think we should be very cautious about not thinking the Arctic is more exceptional than it is. Uh, I think most things in the Arctic are common phenomena. So for example, my area, Arctic International Relations, uh, the Arctic historically has been a very integrated part of international relations and it usually reflects world order and it continues to do so. Uh, so when it comes to energy security in the Arctic, I think it, you can look at it, at, of course you should look at it at different levels. So if we look at it 
as at uh, societies, communities in the Arctic. So their energy security. So the Arctic is an enormous region. You often have very small, isolated communities. Greenland is a, a very strong case of that. Uh, so you have a lot of, you could call, energy or infrastructure islands. Um, and, and that's very expensive. It's, it's very challenging to ensure affordable, stable energy provision in these places. But that's not something particularly Arctic. I mean, you have lots of tropical mm -hmm. islands who have exactly the same issue. Um, and then if you look at it at, how to say, at a, a more macro level, uh, as we talked about a, a moment ago, that um, that Arctic uh, energy resources, I mean, they, they are part of, of the global energy system, energy markets. Uh, and there again, um, especially Russia, especially the Russian Arctic is, is a very, uh, Russia is one of the world's three largest oil and gas producers with the United States and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So, of course, for example, Arctic, uh, Russian Arctic regions, well, they're very unique compared to, let's say, Saudi Arabia, but it's also very general in the way that they are suppliers for a global energy economy. Mm. You had a very nice, obviously, quite global perspective to this, but if I bring mm. it down to Finland and Norway, mm -hmm. which is uh, with the Finnish and Nordic and Finnish and Arctic um, Finnish and Norwegian Arctic regions are the ones that I study in my research. So in the broader project, we study the broader security implications of zero carbon energy transitions. And in the case of Arctic in Finland and Norway, we come down to, of course, what is Arctic in general. So I personally, I grew up in Ulikiminki, which mm -hmm. is a small town next to Oulu. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that I grew up in the Arctic region until a couple of years ago when I came to Arctic Frontiers and all was on the big screen. But that just tells you that when I was growing up in the 90s, it wasn't a significant thing to mention. It wasn't something that was advertised at all. That branded. Is, yeah. yeah, branded, <laughs> exactly. But nowadays it is. It makes sense. It's, it has uh, monetary uh, interests. It has geopolitical interests, all kinds of issues. Um, and then in this Finnish and Arctic, Finnish and Norwegian Arctic issues in the in this uh, research that we now do, where we wanted to find the interrelations between energy transitions and then uh, security issues. We interviewed uh, a bunch of experts and 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 people who are at the core of this these uh, issues, and we wanted to know what were the the topics that they think about when they think about security and and renewable energy specifically. And most of them wanted to talk about justice, even though we didn't pose that issue to them necessarily. Mm -hmm. So justice in, in this uh, point as well. I, I really like this, that um, what Rasmus said about the small islands, that these people o often have small, <laughs> small their own uh, produced energies or otherwise it's petrol that is brought into their communities. But, but if we... Uh, think about, for instance, Finland, it doesn't have a specific energy policy for the Arctic regions. And I'm kind of thinking now that maybe it should have, maybe the Arctic regions should be somehow more emphasized, not to make it a um, some uh, beautiful thing that can be highlighted somewhere and used as a negative thing about what might happen when this exceptionalism is used, mm -hmm. but to bring it more to the reality that, yes, when there's um, less people, it means you have uh, less opportunities. Uh, mm. Potentially, uh, you don't even have internet ac access everywhere because it's very expensive to build grids, it's uh, expensive to have uh, roads, all kinds of things. So this is different mm. than Helsinki, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm. And, uh, and maybe also th on the matter of securing um, energy for one's uh, production and one's consumption, uh, for all partners in the Arctic, um, do you see that this has changed in relation to uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Um, well, if I continue with the, the same uh, base on the on the research that we're doing at the moment, uh, we did the interviews after the invasion of 22, but in the border, broader project, we had interviews with uh, national experts uh, before and after the invasion. 
And certainly the biggest thing that had changed was the realization that Russia is a threat to Finnish energy system, which wasn't the case before. It was very much underplayed issue in the energy sector because it was financially important and Finland wanted to keep up with this thinking that Russia is a reliable partner and we can do business mm-hmm. together. And the best example for you is, of course, uh, the uh nuclear power plant that was supposed to be built in Buha Yoki, which is very close to Oulu as well. And that plan only got dismantled when uh Russia attacked Ukraine in 2022, not even in 2014 or 16 when we already saw the aggressions. Mm-hmm. So yes, I think this has changed. And also the understanding that renewable energy, even though it's in intermittent, uh I- the technologies are not yet matured enough but there is the potential and the potential comes from the understanding that we actually need this. We can continue with with fossil fuel uh, forever. And that didn't come necessarily with climate change. It only became because it became a geopolitical mm-hmm. issue. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. And, and to follow up briefly on this, um, I mean, after the end of the Cold War, maybe 20, 30 years after the Cold War, I mean, we had globalization and Globalization was about integration of markets, uh, integration of energy markets, uh, te- technology, finance, trade, whatever, uh, commodities. And as I, <coughs> I mentioned a moment ago, that Russia is one of the world's three largest oil and gas producers. And what we are seeing very rapidly in in recent years, it is deglobalization. Um, and as you just mentioned, that. Now we have all kinds of supply uh, su- supply concerns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We don't want to depend on China for critical metal- minerals. We don't want to d- uh, rely on Russia for um, for energy, and and so we see, for example, and and first after 14, and then after 22, uh, after 22, we we see a lot of Western sanctions, uh, commercial. Uh, technological uh, etc sanctions against Russia including uh, Russian energy sector and that is a part of of uh, splitting up the global energy market where uh, the west used to be Russia's main energy market and now of course uh, Russia is turning more and more towards China India and the rest of the world mm-hmm. which reflects how the world is being st- rapidly separated in basically the West against the rest. You see that globally, you see it around Gaza, and you see it in the Arctic. May I continue with that? Yeah. Yes. I have yes, a comment please. on the, the markets and shared markets. And the yes, indeed, we, we mm-hmm. have very, um, well, we can still say functioning en- energy markets with the Nordic countries and, and going um, to Europe as well. And Nord Pool is a Norwegian invention that is has abled uh, sharing and markets and energy markets uh, everywhere. But with this current situation, I I have um, a little bit of a, a fear that if we are taken even not bold to self evidently, because these nationalistic discourses that we already have and because the energy prices have been so high and because, for instance, if you start developing renewable energy via wind turbines in northern Norway, that is actually energy for someone else than the region itself, mm-hmm. which causes, of course, um, negative emotions, negative consequences to the people in the north. So it is. these are issues that we should be able to talk about on very political level as well, that we can't take anything for granted. Mm. Uh, that is a very good observation. And, and the, the 30 years we had after the end of the Cold War with, with globalization and, and its basic economics that bigger markets are more efficient than smaller separated markets. Um, and of course, we had 30 years with hardly any inf- uh, inflation, very low interest rates, which I suspect was very much a product of globalization. And when you cut off, when when you cut markets into smaller markets, they inevit- they become less efficient, and th- there's going to be a welfare cost to that. I mean, we are all going to get poorer because of that. And yeah. now, of course, with the energy crisis, the winter or the high energy prices, the winter 22-23, which uh, paradoxically did not really affect us here in northern Norway, 
because we are an island. Mm. Our grid, our production is not well connected with the rest of Norway. So our energy could not be exported further south. It's connected to European mm. electricity markets. So the retail price follows European energy retail prices which of course drove up these prices. So Norwegian energy producers, they of course, uh, they collected very important energy rents, uh, but the consumers, uh, the voters down south were, were very upset about that. Mm. And maybe that's also the very problem of understanding energy security in the Arctic, because it's, uh, um, it's always taken into like a very geopolitical concern, mm -hmm. which we understand from, from your perspectives, but <coughs> like, um, I guess the consumer just really just want to have some security in terms of like can they can they have the, their business can they can they live here can they yeah do they have a future yeah. here and um. and and, uh, and there I I, I think um, I mean the, the this this very short definition of energy security the reliable supply at a for affordable price it is a very useful starting point for talking about energy security. <sighs> One example I heard about, for example, bakeries, many places in Europe, they've really suffered mm -hmm. mm. 22, 23, because a bakery is a small <laughs> energy mm -hmm. intensive business. And I mean, many European bakeries, I mean, their energy bills went through the roof. Mm. Which is immediately a more expensive bread mm. for the consumer. Exactly, and mm. um, yeah, maybe we, uh, because we talked about different energy sources, but also the word green transition is a word that has been yeah floating around and is constantly being brought up. And maybe for our listeners also uh, listening to the live broadcast, could you maybe explain a bit what is this green transition and how are we going to see it, for example, within the Arctic now? Energy transition is uh, the transition of a society towards. Uh, uh, less polluting or completely uh, not polluting uh, ways of using and producing energy. So it's a shift away from fossil fuel energy. And this green shift uh, that they use in, in, in Norway, of course, and that's because you asked about what was the difference, uh, what happened with the war, for instance. And before the war, the Norwegian informants that we had, for instance, for our research, they they kind of they they were saying that we don't do we really have a green shift here in Norway even because we already have so much renewable energy, uh, but nowadays it's not contested anymore. It's it is in the narrative. It's in the discussion. It's everywhere. We've heard it fifteen times this morning exactly. already. Mm. So uh, it's not a question anymore. But yeah. I liked what the prime minister said today. He wanted to um, talk about four different transitions. And I thought it was a useful way to try and materialize how complicated it actually is, the socioeconomic perspective of the transition. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, and there are huge uh, rewards for, for this transition, first and foremost uh, mitigating climate change, but there's also all kinds of public health uh, benefits to, to decarbonizing uh, energy. But of course, the other side is that fossil fuels are incredibly profitable and incredibly practical. And you see in Norwegian society how enormously it has benefited from its fossil fuel uh, resources. And it's 15 years ago, I, s I saw an illustration which showed the energy density, both in terms of weight and volume. I mean, how much energy is like in a liter or a kilo, and it compared uh, petrol, uh, petrol batteries, and maybe hydrogen. Mm. And of course, the, the damn thing is that petrol has such a high energy density, both when it comes to weight and volume. And that's of course why petrol cars, airplanes, etc., are so incredibly convenient. <laughs> and it's so damn hard mm. to get out of. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have some Arctic, uh, well, you have some communities all around the world, uh, also Arctic communities, that have renewable energy uh, resources on site, hydropower, geothermal power, wind power. And they are, they, they are very privileged. I mean, Iceland is a fantastic mm -hmm. example of that, 
uh, northern Scandinavia, uh, hydropower, etc. If you don't have local renewable energy, then you're then you're really in trouble. I was in Longyearby in Svalbard last uh, week, and the 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 thing about Svalbard is the only local energy source is coal, and that's why you had no settlement before mm. the coal system, and going beyond that coal system. Now they have a diesel-based system. I'm not sure it's much better shipping diesel to Svalbard than mm. using local coal, but as, as far as I understand, there is no local uh, renewable energy. So what kind of measures do the governments need to take in terms of like securing uh, this energy to the, to the people? Or are they doing that already? Um, yeah. Uh, very briefly, I, I mean, uh, then I think we come into, as as you mentioned, the social technical questions of like hybrid energy systems, microgrids, um, and again, these are very general questions. I mean, you have uh, small island communities all over the world, mountaintop communities, mm -hmm. wherever. They are all facing the same challenge of of making as green microgrids as possible. But then I would like to bring the issue of uh, what's part of the socio-technical transition as well is the culture mm -hmm. and our ability to actually change our ways. And it's so easy just to stick with the old, mm -hmm. stick with the same very familiar way. It might be a little bit bad, but it's always worked. And also if the price isn't right, then the the real concrete transition is quite hard to do. And that's something that I think that this understanding since Russian invasion to Ukraine has really brought to people um, as well as the politicians that we have to be able to adjust our own behavior and our thinking. That has been obviously the goal for a long time um, and the understanding of, of um, cultural change alongside the technical change has been for a long time. But I think that now we really see it mm -hmm. that now we have to be able to trust the future that there will be ways to use energy with less polluting way and mm. also to produce it. Mm. Mm. Do you then foresee that there will sometimes in the in the future would be would be possible for the Arctic state to uh, to resolve these potential resource conflicts through existing international frameworks as it seems like they are struggling to do it nationally um, through science cooperation through diplomacy which might not consider the Arctic uh, society um, 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 what's called um, benefits, but but more uh, taking it from their own standpoint. So a more like geopolitical view, where they, where the big states only benefit mostly themselves. Do you have a global perspective on this? Because <laughs> I can then maybe. Well talk. I, I think how to say. I mean. There's, there's been a lot of talk about various conflicts in the Arctic, and, and I, I think the, the picture is uh, it's much more peaceful than you might think. Uh, Maybe it's also, the, like we heard in the big picture mm -hmm. yesterday, yeah. is that the media just blow so it up a lot. So, so there, yeah. is, there are very significant uh, energy resources, oil, gas, in the Arctic. But those resources are, as far as I can remember, practically exclusively in undisputed jurisdictions. I mean, they are mm. on land, very much the uh, Russian Arctic, and they are in, in clear uh, exclusive economic zones. So, so there are no, there's no disputes about these energy resources. The Arctic is historically, especially since the Cold War, and continues to be very key to international security, and that has a lot to do with nuclear weapons. Mm. But but that is not how to say it's not really has anything to do with the Arctic itself and and with the resources there, and uh, I mean we have a horrible war in in, in uh, Ukraine we have horrible violence in Gaza, uh, we have various conflicts around the world that affect the Arctic, but I think it's also very important to to understand that conflicts in the Arctic are almost always spillovers from conflicts elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only resource in quotation mark war in the Arctic I can think about were the 
British Icelandic cod wars in the 50s and 70s. I mean, where you have a zero-sum game over these m marine resources uh, between Iceland and the United Kingdom, and of course, Iceland uh, ultimately prevails. I mean, that was a local resource conflict that did not come from the outside. Uh, but, uh, I mean, when we have heavy militarization in this part of the world here, it has a lot to do with all the nuclear weapons in this region. Mm. I could continue with that um, note on the, yeah, the security thinking that it should be broader than military and state security thinking. And the cheapest form of uh, security and defense is people in the area, which means that people should be able to have a good life and mm. well-being and, and opportunities to live in these rural areas as well. And that, of course, brings us to the question of the indigenous rights and their rights to their culture and their heritage to live in this area. And that clashes significantly with the renewable energy uh, production plants that we currently have, including mining. Mm. So non-critical and critical uh, materials that mm. are known to be significant in the the sea uh, th in the land here in the in the north is of course something that we should be somehow able to solve and i because you you asked that do it do are there ways to come around this and i certainly do think like like we heard uh, just today in the panel in the morning i really think that this um early intervention if you want to call it or early inclusion of different kinds of uh, people and the real cooperation with the people in the area is of course important. Mm. We can talk about it in academic ter terms and call it whatever we want to, but in reality that's what it is. Mm. And I do have high hopes because Finland has just recently renewed the uh, cl uh, climate and climate law and with that law they introduced a new body for legislation uh, where the new Sami Climate Council is a new uh, body, permanent body to participate and talk about the effects of climate change to their cultural heritage in Finnish Lapland. And this body has a real possibility to be able to talk about these issues and partake in the decision making. So I do have hopes for that too. Mm -hmm. It's just started uh, at the end of last year, so we will of course see the results later. Mm. And, and to follow up on that, I mean, these different kinds of security, they, they, they affect each other very much. And the old-fashioned, hardcore state security militarization, military activities are often highly polluting. Mm. They're socially highly disruptive. So during the Cold War, where we had an exceptional level of militarization in the Arctic, we had uh, radiological pollution from that, uh, chemical pollution from that. We had forced displacement of indigenous people. Um, and to the ex and also, I mean, uh, energy extraction, mining, are often environmentally, socially, culturally, they're highly disruptive processes. So, remilitarization, uh, it it's very detrimental for like environmental security, human security, etc. And um, we in the West, we used to outsource the pollution, etc. We used to outsource all the mm -hmm detrimental effects of mining to other parts of the world. We don't dare to do that anymore, so we're bringing it back. But with that, we're also bringing back all the pollution, all the mm -hmm. social and cultural disruption. Mm. Do we still have time? <laughs> Maybe a quick add comment. Add yeah. I just wanted to add that in the, in the, the interviews that I did with the Arctic um, interviewees here, with the current situation, uh, many of the, the people who live here all of a sudden saw the need to, or maybe they have done that before, but now it's definitely highlighted that they are justifying their way of living and their way of being here by being providers of national security because they have the the needed mm. tools, the needed knowledge, the possibilities to be here, s even give surveillance uh, aid to the state because uh, mm. they can access very remote areas if they see something different. And I think that is definitely something that uh, we need to be aware of, that it, it's, it cannot be part of just transition where some people are only allowed to stay in an area uh, mm -hmm. because it's beneficial for state security. Because I couldn't do that. I couldn't justify my way of living 
by providing national security for that. Why should anyone else in Finland do that? Yeah. Uh, and maybe just on the last note then, um, thank you so much, but uh, if you could look into the crystal ball, <laughs> <laughs> how would you foresee the energy security being played out in the future in the Arctic? Which I guess is mostly influenced by geopolitics. And now we didn't cover China and Asia's influence. I can in touch upon that briefly. Yeah, <laughs> <but> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I would like to say that it's not only about geopolitics. I see it very much as a national issue, that mm-hmm. it is up to our national governments to be aware of these things. It's uh, up to the politicians and it's about representation. If you think about the representation of the Nordic, uh, of the Nord <laughs> North uh, people from the north, from Lapland, we have a couple of members of the parliament in the Finnish parliament and even less in European Union where the actual decisions are going to be made uh, towards the way we uh, we use and produce energy in these areas. So it is indeed about the geopolitics and maybe you can continue on that one, but national policy making is really important. So democracy in general and the way we vote. So if we take, how to say, two far ends of the spectrum. I mean, if we take small, in quotation mark, uh, energy infrastructure island communities in the Arctic. Uh, I think their situation will improve because we have improvements in, in these hybrid uh, hybrid microgrid systems. Um, so I'm cautiously optimistic there. There's a lot of interesting work uh, going on in, in such things. And then if we go to the, the global, the macro level, I mean, what we see is the world being split up, the West and the rest. Um, and and we see that splitting up in, in so many domains, including energy, including the Arctic. So the Russian, the vast Russian Arctic uh, energy resources, they will, in the foreseeable future, they will go to China, they will go to India, they will go to the rest of the world. And now we haven't touched on, talked about Alaska. Alaska also mm-hmm. had has big energy resources. Alaska had big hopes for exporting uh, liquefied natural gas to China, and that, of course, is gone. Mm. So the world is splitting up, the Arctic is splitting up, energy is splitting up. And on the last note, who is the loser here? Is it the Arctic, uh, the Arctic societies? Will they just be exploit, exploited? Not necessarily. Right. Of course, we do have quite a lot of uh, opportunities mm. in the North as well with these new plans that mm. have laid laid out mm. but it has to be done in a mm. socially unjust way yeah yeah but i mean if the world is split up in the with the rest and the rest um i guess most of the arctic states are allies to the us mm. i mean you have the arctic seven we could call the nato arctic Mm. Uh, and, then you have <laughs> the, uh, and, and then you have the the Russian half of the Arctic, mm. um, and uh, I mean the the conflicts, the violence we see now, it's it's horrible, and I must say I'm pessimistic, and I'm of course by far the oldest person here, and uh, I feel I mean I realize that that how to say the the openness, the optimism, the 90s, the early 2000s was. Uh, unique moment and I'm extremely sad to see that I I think the world uh, will get more and more separate more and more divided more and more closed so in that way we all lose Mm. so not really ending on a positive note (laughs) but uh, (laughs) yeah that's okay that's okay yeah yeah thank you very much thank you so much thank you yeah and uh, yeah pleasure let's keep this uh, discussion going Um, thank you very much yeah thank you and uh, yeah, you, I guess you can listen to Radio Arctic's other episode on our website, radioarctic.net. And um, yeah. Yeah, tuning out from Arctic Frontiers, the last episode. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much for joining today. Thank you very Thank much you. for having me.